Welcome to the 14th Cavalry Futures Symposium on Neuroeconomics in, in China and in Asia. This is a very unusual title of a meeting, <laughs> and I think it's first of, the, of this kind uh, in China, uh, uh, new, Neuroeconomics. Um, we, we all know the ultimate goal of neuroscience is to understand human behavior. And one of the most important human behavior is, is making economic decisions. That's how society survive and thrive. Huh? And Shanghai is a particularly good place for this meeting. Uh, it's the economic center of China, and probably on, on the on, uh, entire Asia pretty soon. Um, people here are interested in many, in many sectors of economy. Uh, you know this new e economic uh, zone, it was just, just opened up, uh, and the uh, science for economy, uh, if neuroscience can contribute, uh, it will be uh, one of the best things we can do for, Ch for Shanghai. Uh, so this is a good symposium of, uh, of a great potential. So uh, I welcome, uh, on behalf of the uh, Institute of Neuroscience, uh, all the participants, all the speakers from abroad for today's uh, uh, invited session as well as all the panel discussion. Uh, so um, I uh, would I like to begin with this uh, symposium with some real science, hopefully, from, from our institute, part from my group and from other group. Uh, very grow, big title. So I, I want to uh, talk about neuroplasticity in, um, on a syn synapse level and, uh, and cognition. Uh, neuroplasticity, as we know, uh, starts from the activity in the brain. Uh, the activity associated with sensory, motor, cognitive experiences will cause changes in the nervous system in the neuronal and synaptic level. These changes, this modification, uh, will change the behavior of the nervous system. There will, there will be learning and memory and changes in cognition and various sorts of behavior, including economic behavior. Uh, the idea of how the activity can modify the nervous system, I think the modern era starts from HEPs. Donald HEP proposed in 1949 that correlated activity between pre- and post-synaptic cells will cause this, uh, the uh, modification of the synapse between them. It will strengthen the synapse, stabilize the synapse. This uh, potentiation of the synaptic connection by correlated activity has been demonstrated to be true, widespread in the nervous system. Uh, the activity we now know as uh, long-term potentiation. In 1973, uh, Gunther Stern thought that if you have potentiation of the connections, you might, uh, uh, it's better to have a weakening of synapse, uh, a symmetric modification, so that not all synapses become potentiated uh, in the brain. And uh, the, uh, he postulated that uncorrelated activity, uh, if they can weaken and uh, eliminate the synapse, then we have a very symmetric learning rule. Uh, this actually is, uh, found evidence from studies from Masao Ito on the LTD, long-term depression, and in the hippocampus uh, by Mark Bayer and uh, Malanka. So these two rules together, we now know a uh, very general way of thinking about this, is a cell stuff wired together, a fire together, we wire together. Uh, this helps uh, postulate begin actually with Hap's idea that the perception is represented here by um, a circle, a perception of a circle. Uh, it would introduce, uh, how do they in, uh, in, uh, imprint a perceptual memory in the brain? He imagined that a group of cells, uh, uh, he called cell assembly, will be specifically activated by a, a, percep a perceptual experience. And they cause the uh, extensive firing, reverberating firing among, the among this group. And the connection among them becomes strengthened. And once the connections become strengthened, the memories, perceptual memory is established. Then when you come, come with uh, partial uh, cues, you can evoke 
some of the cells within the assembly to fire, and that will introduce the entire cell to uh, the entire assembly to fire. You have a recall of the perceptual memory. Uh, this is a very useful idea of uh, establishment of assembly, and then recall the memory by partial stimulus. Now you can see this perceptual experience, right? Uh, you, what can you see? Well, you might be able to see there's a dog, a uh, Dalmatian dog, the uh, dog with white white dog with uh, black spots on the surface. Now you can recognize immediately perceive an uh, image of a dog because in your memory you have already a set, uh, as, uh, established a set a cell assembly to recognize this, and the partial stimulus now recall that memory. Right? This is a, uh, a, a simple way of use uh, HAP's idea. Now the assembly could be an assembly of a particular memory of a dog. Uh, um, uh, assembly could be an assembly of a concepts uh, about a person, about the name, the, his face, uh, his behavior, all together would be a concept. And right? that concept, the basis of this assembly could be the basis for decision making. Right? This, is, this is how perceptual uh, learning could be related to decision making. Now the LTP discovered by Bliss and Lomo shows that in, uh, in many synapses in the central nervous system, repetitive firing with high frequency immediately produce an increase in the strength of the synapse called LTP. If you have a, a low frequency fire with a long uh, duration, you get LTD. So the, this can be explained by correlate firing. High frequency with fire postsynaptic cells or pre and postsynaptic cells are fired together. Low frequency are not sufficient to fire postsynaptic cells. They impart a signal, uh, so the presynaptic cell is firing, but postsynaptic cells are not firing. Uh, in that case, you get an LTD. Uh, so perhaps learning rule is uh, pretty good in explaining this. However, in the last 15 years, uh, work done by uh, Henry Marquand, uh, Bert Sackman in our lab, show that the LT, the correlated activity is not all everything. You have to have the uh, timing element in it. In ter it turns out that if you have a synaptic input that comes in before the spiking of the postsynaptic cell, that input gets strengthened. But the same input, if it comes after the spike, the spiking of the postsynaptic cell, it becomes weakened. Even though the correlation for these two type of the stimulus are all correlated within 10 milliseconds. The timing of firing of presynaptic cell before postsynaptic cell is important because it contributes to the firing. There's a causal relationship, so the, this synapse gets rewarded. While this synapse comes in, while other synapses already fire the cell, they did not contribute, they uh, become weakened. So there's a causality in the synaptic modification if you impart this timing-specific learning rule. So the learning rule has been modified now. Uh, this is probably the, the, uh, the, uh, the modern version of HAP's learning rule that says that correlated firing uh, could either strengthen or weaken in a synapse. But uh, uh, depending on the temporal order, pre before post, you have strengthening. Post before pre, you have weakening. And this will, is now called spike timing dependent plasticity. The timing of events is very important for, for memory. We, mem we memorize everything uh, in terms of uh, the, the nature of the event and the time of the event uh, that, has, uh, that was ha happening. Right? So the sequence of timing is very important. How do we, could the SDTP, the spike timing dependent plasticity, uh, impact on the learning rule? So we have this uh, HAPS assembly, right? It was a circle, now I, I, we put it in, in a linear form. Everyone is still connected to every other cell groups. If we now impart a sequence firing, uh, this is a thought experiment, if we have a, we excite the sequence of groups with a, with a, uh, a direction, right? There's a, uh, a, a, a sequential firing of these groups, always from one side to the other. Then after this sequential firing, based on spike time independent plasticity, you will strengthen all the downstream synapse, while the upstream connection will be weakened. So in the end, you will have impact a memory of a sequence. So now if you have a partial sig signal comes in, well, you, you want to record the sequence, you just, you just have to flash, flash it upstream neurons. That would just uh, uh, file the downstream cell assembly. 
Right? So this would be a way that the sequence memory, based on the, uh, the spike time-independent plasticity, gives you a memory of temporal sequence. Right? Now, is this really true? This is a thought experiment. Can we demonstrate this in, in, uh, in real life? So here's a mouse. Uh, a rat, actually, with a multi electro recording from the V1, visual, uh, primary visual cortex. We can re uh, record the response of all these uh, uh, groups, uh, and we can file them in a sequence if the, f uh, the stimulus fall along their receptive field. This is the receptive field of each electro. Right? So if you, f you fire in a sequence with a moving spot in the, in the, uh, in the visual field, you, uh, you fire the cells, in a sequence. Right? So this is uh, learning. So once you have the sequential firing, now you, uh, you can expect the experiment it would be to show after repetitive uh, sequential uh, uh, training, you can uh, now test with a flash in the, in the beginning spot or in the end spot and see which one now impart, evoke the, the sequential uh, uh, firing. Right? So if the memory is, is already imprinted in this, for firing along this direction, then you get more sequential firing along this direction. Right? So the result is, in fact, the case. So sequential, this is the electro recording, the roster for the electro, uh, firing activity. For 16 electro, you see that when you're doing the training with a moving light spot, you get this sequential firing, this, fi this electro firing first, and then this fire late, uh, last. So we have very nice sequential firing during the training. So the question is, if you just flash the initial uh, spot with, uh, before the training, there's no sequential firing, it's random. Right? There's a activity evoked in, in the cortex, but no sequential spiking. But after the training, now you see, uh, in many cases, you see clear memory of the sequ sequence firing. So now you have a way to, to you show that V1 Maybe V1 cells uh, are all randomly connected. Now the, they now remembers the, there's a, uh, a uh, sequential stimulus in the visual field. Right? You, that sequence is memorized. But is V1 cell really sufficient for this? Right? One way to do this, in this day, there's a, uh, this two student uh, has performed the, this work. Uh, you can do optogenetics way of just firing the cell without visual stimulus. You see whether it is sufficient to impact a learning memory, a uh, learning of the sequence. So you put, uh, you, you transfect the neurons with, with uh, channel rhodopsin, and then you, uh, you can excite in a sequence the, uh, the cell groups along, uh, in the V1. Right? So this is the equivalent of exciting the visual field, but now the upstream visual system are not activated. You only activate in the V1 uh, pyramidal cells. So after this, you can then test whether, whether flashing the initial spot would create the, the effects. So this is a very nice, uh, this is better than visual stimulus. You can actually fire each electrode, uh, are recording the spikes in a very nice sequence. Right? So now after this firing, this training, what happened to the, uh, can you recall this memory? Right? The, the answer is yes, we can do that. Uh, so this is, the, during the training, you have a very nice uh, uh, sequence firing. Before training, a flash produced spontaneous firing, no obvious sequence. But after training, there is a significant, you have to do quantitative analysis, which I will not show. You have a significant, actually, increase in the sequential firing. So. Yes, it's sufficient. Firing of a cell. So now we have to show that this sequential firing can induce spike time independent change in the synapse. We have to show, in fact, we have already shown that uh, in, uh, this, fire, uh, this uh, memory requires AMDA receptors. Right? If you block the AMDA receptor, AMDA receptor dependent synaptic processes require for this, for this uh, phenomenon. So now I'm going to go to the, to the next step, the big, big jump from synapse to cognition. Now I would like to uh, uh, separate cognition in three different levels. Now the most familiar form of cognition is the uh, cognition about outside world. We, uh, we perceive the world, uh, all kinds of sensory perception. We have a concept about the outside world. 
or form concepts and categorize different things. We learn and memorize that. We make decision based on this. I think this, this level of cognition, in fact, can be studied in many animal model systems, uh, including from Drosophila to mice to monkey. They all, you, can you can all study this type of uh, cognition. Uh, this, I would say, the, the first level of cognition. There's a second level of cognition, I say, is the cognition of oneself. Now, this is probably important for economic behavior as well. Uh, that you not only recognize the outside world, you have to recognize you are there, you have the benefit from that, you, uh, you are the person communicating with the outside world. This is the basis for a lot of higher level cognition. Now, uh, how many animals, how, what kind of animals that has this, the self-awareness? It's probably limited to human and a few primates. Because one way of looking at when you, you, you have self-awareness is that you, you, you can recognize yourself in the mirror. You see an image in the mirror, you say, oh, that's me. Right? That's, that's part of the self-awareness, the way you can test. Right? Only human and a few primates can pass this. Um, there's a third level of cognition I think is even more complicated. That co cognition is the language. Once you have your self-awareness, now you, have, you, you, you can form language, you can communicate with other people. You know other people are talking to you, you can respond properly. You, uh, this uh, cognition probably is unique to human. No primate has been trained to use human, -like, uh, human language um, uh, in any form that's similar to human language. So self-awareness and mirror self-recognition. Only human of few species have been shown that given the mirror, they can actually uh, seem to be aware of themselves, examine themselves uh, in the mirror. Apes, chimps, uh, uh, not monkey. A monkey, 40 years of work have not been able uh, to show uh, that monkey can, can do this. Human baby can acquire the, uh, this by two years of age. And this is very uh, interesting. Is this ability to, uh, and endogenous genetic program, or this is ability to learn through through after birth? Uh, some psychiatric autistic patients lost this ability. Right? So self awareness is, is what is the origin? Uh, what is the neural circuit basis? Is an interesting problem. So recently, uh, in in uh, in our institute. Uh, Gong Lin, Dr. Gong and his student have performed a set of experiments on monkey and demonstrate you can train monkey, research monkey, to learn self, mirror self-recognition. Uh, in this work, what he, he did is a cute experiment. He used laser pointer, or a high power laser pointer, to point to the monkey sitting on a chair, uh, shining on a face from the side. Uh, and that laser, laser pen impact a, 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 a sensory, a, a slight uh, tickling feeling to the, to the monkey. Uh, so monkey would react and by touching its own face. So the, this trend is to establish an image in the, on the face with a sensation on the face, right? this uh, association. Now, this is the, uh, how it was done. Right. So, uh, so we, uh, we, you have to train them to do this, uh, to encourage them to do this behavior. So uh, very quickly, within a, within a week, every monkey does this 100%, 99%. Every time there's a light shining on it. So now you change the laser power to a low power plane so that the, uh, there's no feeling, pre presumably. Uh, this low power, low, low power laser now still uh, they, they can see this and, and react. So now they, they, have, uh, they are conditioned, so to speak, to react with a spot on their face, with touching on that spot, and, and uh, there's a food. Now, if we now take food away, can they establish uh, association and then become curious and always uh, do this behavior? Uh, the answer is yes. Well, one way you said, or when you say monkey doesn't have a feeling, maybe they, have, they can feel this and the human cannot. We cannot feel this low power laser. So uh, an experiment is to do the video screen, a mirror video image, and then use a cursor on the face to see whether the monkey can do it. Right? And in this case, indeed, they can do it. Right? So, they, so 
So they really made, made a, established the, uh, the connection. And there's no food reward anymore. Right? So finally, the, the, the real traditional mark test. This is why the people in the field, the, new, the primary ethologists, are uh, always doing this mark test, putting a dye on his face and see what monkey would touch the face. Now this is the standard <coughs> the benchmark test. Uh, first is the light mark. You can use, uh, you can, you can use, uh, uh, I can pass the light mark. Let's just go, go for the dye mark. You put some, uh, put dye on the surface, right? on, a, a fa on the face. Now, no food reward is now. So there's a mark on the, a black mark here. Uh, uh, a green, green dye on that side. Oh, so, okay, they did it well on the chair. So now let's put it back to the cage. Natural environment, what do they do? Right? The, the, in a natural environment, they, they can do very nicely uh, with a low power laser. Uh, they would do, uh, they, they can see in the mirror, they can do, uh, they can trace the, 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 the dye, uh, the, the laser pointer. So now dye mark, the, uh, the standard dye mark test, uh, only th three monkey, only two out of two passed it. So now we have five monkeys, the new group have five, uh, five monkeys, three out of five passed the light mark. Not every monkey, some, some monkeys are st stupid. Uh, <laughs> you, they just cannot, uh, cannot learn the final step uh, to pass the test. Uh, and in this first group of three, the uh, two monkeys actually passed. This is without mirror, this is with mirror, and they all, they all can do this. And they also touch the face at the right time. In other words, uh, when they are looking at the mirror, they, they, would, they would do this. And also stereotype behavior, touching and looking and sm you know, smelling. <laughs> okay. So, now, how do we know they are actually recognize themselves rather than just a monkey with a mark on the face? Right? How, do they, how do we know they are? Uh, so one test, and this is not a perfect test, one test is to say, well, we put another monkey on the other side of a glass wall that marked the same way on his face. And see whether the monkey, see that mon uh, the other monkey on the other side, they will touch their own face. Right? And you alternate this uh, glass wall and a mirror back and forth, 30 minutes each, and then you, 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 you count how many times they, they touch their own face. So this mirror glass or wall experiment show that indeed, when, they, when there's a glass wall, they, 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 uh, the monkey would just show social behavior. They want to talk to each other, they want to touch each other. Right, but when the mirror is in, the same monkey will immediately start to, uh, to touch their mark. Right. So indeed, uh, it's not just another monkey with a face. You put two monkeys in the same room, the other monkey with a marked face. The trained monkey looking at the other monkey in the same cage. Now this is not across the mirror, uh, not across the, uh, the glass. They would also touch the other monkey's face rather than their own. Right. So this is again another uh, evidence. So finally, I think this is uh, much more important. It's a spontaneous behavior. Now we train the animal to touch the face. Now we mark on the, on the ear. They, they look at the ear, other places that they cannot see. They would, by looking at the mirror, they would, they would touch it. Spontaneous behavior. This spontaneous behavior, um, now, no, no dire mark anyway. Now you see whether, the, whether one of the monkey, the, the, this is a, two, both monkeys are trained. You can see this trained monkey the spontaneous behaviors that they, they, they become interested in themselves by looking at the mirror. <laughs> no, they want to look at places where they, they cannot see before. <laughs> oh, this is the next. Okay, uh, I think this is a uh, final. The, 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 there's a hairs on the face, so this monkey, trained monkeys pulling the hair. The untrained monkey, 
uh, naive monkey cannot learn. Six months together with a trained monkey, they cannot learn the behavior. They ha it has to be trained. This association has to be trained. Okay, so the implication of this study is that rhesus monkey, you can now train prim a primate which does not have self, mirror self-recognition ability, now can learn self-recognition. Human baby may learn this during the first year of, uh, of life. Now maybe the, the mother is saying, well, look, look, baby, baby in the mirror, baby in the mirror. After this type of uh, suggestion and training, they eventually learn that baby uh, then self-awareness in the, in the uh, mirror. Impairment of self-awareness uh, in humans may be treated by training uh, of visual somatosensory association in front of the mirror. So this is, uh, I hope that this type of study, once we, we now have a monkey train, we can look at the circuits. We can look at functional MRI uh, and see what happened in the brain that monkey has been trained. And then we can understand self the origin of self-awareness. Okay, so this is a work done by people in, in the institute, Xu Shenjin, Jiang Wanchen, Yan Xinjian, Zhang Den, they're all students in the institute, uh, Gong Nen, uh, 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 investigator, and uh, uh, his student, Zhang Liangtang. So I, my, I stop here, and uh, I think I'm a few minutes past the time. Um, thank you for your attention.